The Freedom from Religion Foundation inaugurated a new award. It's a statuette embodying the motto, Forward. And it's to recognize individuals who have moved society forward. And forward happens to be the state motto of Wisconsin, which is the home state of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And um, it's been represented for many, many years by this archetypal statue of a woman who is supposed to embody the concept. It was sculpted by a young Wisconsin artist for the World Columbia Exposition of 1892 when feminists got together and commissioned women sculptors to sculpt a statue embodying each of their state uh, mottos. And the statue that Jean Minor did was so beloved and so good that the women of this era, before most women had access to professions where they could earn money, raised thousands of dollars to recast the statue in copper repoussé, like the Statue of Liberty, and gifted her to the people of Wisconsin. And this um, sat on the Wisconsin Avenue side of the Wisconsin State Capitol in Madison for many, many years. Then along came Governor Tommy Thompson. And uh, in 1995, he was a very backward governor, our governor then, we have another one, but uh, he decided to depose the statue. He said, oh, she's falling apart. We need to put her in the basement. How's that for symbolism? So my mother and I then embarked on what I believe will be was our only popular crusade. <laughs> and that was we launched a petition to save Forward. And it was so popular, preservationists joined us, even many Republican legislators and sponsors signed this petition to save Forward. And, and Tommy Thompson was a good politician. He knew when he was licked. And he uh, agreed to raise money to recast the statue, and they moved her. It was, she was moved to make room for a police memorial. But she now stands at the corner of State Street, and that is where all the best uh, pickets and protests take place. So more than three years ago, I began this quest to try to capture the concept of the forward statue image and turn it into a statuette for FFRF's new award. And we are on round three, and we have finally found a winner. And I am very, very, very proud that we are giving out today what is not just a statuette, but it is a work of art. And as yet, it is the only such work of art. It's the prototype for future such statuettes. And I'm proud that a feminist male sculptor has donated his time and artistry to fulfill my wish to make this award embodying forward. And it's a concept, it's poetry, it's art. So Zenas Fridakis, whom you met last night and you met last year, who's helped us with the uh, Clarence Darrow statue, who's com who created it and helped us uh, renovate a statue of Robert Ingersoll, uh, has spent hours and hours, days and days, of, um, to take the best of forward and then make her even better, uh, more confident, graceful, and updated. So it's a new, con it's a concept of this board, but it's not a copy. And yesterday, uh, Zenas flew in from Philadelphia to hand deliver forward. So it's been a photo finish. <laughs> and this is a statue of the original uh, forward from 1892. And here is the statuette. Oh, that's another picture of her. Here's the statuette. And I think that she looks like she's ready to lead a march to the barricades. <laughs> and uh, show you some other views. And here she is. It's very heavy. <laughs> it's bronze. Now for the important part. <laughs> Truly embodying a female moving society forward is our next speaker, an honoree, Cecile Richards. I just finished reading Cecile Richards' wonderful new book, Make Trouble, 
Standing Up, Speaking Out, and Finding the Courage to Lead, which is part memoir, part recipe for how and why to become a troublemaker and an activist. And I was truly amazed in, in reading Making Forward to run across a quote that she used. She cited from Tony Kushner, uh, from, who wrote Angels in America, and she quotes him saying, the world only spins forward. So Cecile Richards has been working diligently over the course of her entire lifetime to get the world to spin forward. She's a self-described nonconformist who majored in history but says she minored in agitating. <laughs> she has so many quotable quotes and advice on standing up and speaking out, including, get comfortable with making others uncomfortable. <laughs> Cecile's memoir is sprinkled with advice about activism and how she came to consider being a troublemaker, a, quote, badge of honor, being a thorn in someone's side, standing up for injustice, or just plain raising hell. She has worked for labor rights to organize the most downtrodden workers, especially women. Then Cecile founded the Texas Freedom Network. After she became aware of the grip of the Christian coalition and the, quote, targeted culture war, to demonize politicians who supported women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and gun safety reform, casting supposed God-fearing candidates against everyone else. Cecile writes, I decided it was time for me to start raising some hell of my own. After three years, leaving the Texas Freedom Network in good shape, she moved on. She worked for Jane Fonda and Ted Turner, helping to support groups working for reproductive rights. She worked for Nancy Pelosi on Capitol Hill, who soon became the first woman ever to lead her party in Congress. Then Cecile, <laughs> seeing a need going unmet, started yet another group, America Votes, the largest collection of progressive grassroots organizations working together to register, educate, and turn out voters, a group still active today. And next, the challenge of a lifetime uh, she was asked to lead Planned Parenthood, which uh, serves 2.4 million people a year and has done so for the past 12 years under Cecile's uh, leadership. She modernized services there. She weathered some of its most challenging storms, including the phony accusation that Planned Parenthood sold fetal body parts, uh, the Wendy Davis and her filibuster fighting defunding of Planned Parenthood in Texas, the constant funds, of course, to def uh, fight to defend it federally, Dr. Tiller's murder. Yet through all this, keeping Planned Parenthood, which she calls a judgment-free zone, thriving. And in, um, she has retired from Planned Parenthood, and she has been working diligently this year uh, to support women candidates and help get out the vote. She says, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to decide who we are as individuals and as a country. Before Cecile comes up here to get this award, I want to give a word about the format. She's requested that we do this in the form of a conversation. So I will get to ask her questions kind of informally, and there should be time to take five or 10 uh, minutes of questions afterward from you. And then Cecile will graciously sign copies of Make Trouble here in this room, and we'll have, uh, have her over there. And you can still buy the books over there. And this book is available for sale while, while it lasts over there. So I want to ask Zenas Frudakis to please come up. And he's going to hand Cecile the award on our behalf. And Cecile, can you come up? And be prepared. It's very heavy. I've always admired you. This so is, beautiful. Uh, Thank beautiful. you. Thank you. Oh, here. Can let's get a photograph. Okay. It's just gorgeous. Oh, I'm so thank honored. You. Thank you. We from the Religion Foundation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here, um, and this is spectacular. And it's really, it's, it's so important because, of course, there are barely any monuments of women anywhere in the United States That's of America, right. so why not start here? <laughs> it's yes. really great. Well, so we just met briefly yes. before this and exchanged some anecdotes about the fact that you have 
fraternal twins, and I'm a fraternal twin, and do you want to say that dumb question we keep getting asked? <laughs> That's kind of funny. So yeah, Actually, I talk about my twins in my book because I was pregnant with twins when my mother was running for governor uh, in Texas, and uh, somehow I stayed on the campaign trail. But anyway, I had, yeah, I have a boy and girl twin, Hannah and Daniel, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I've walked down the street and people will stop me and say, are they, I, are they identical? <laughs> Like, well, like, I mean, I'd have a lot of money if I had a dollar for every time I've been asked that. <laughs> Except for a few notable, like, yeah, n notable things, yes, you know. So, <laughs> um, so I just finished reading and loving your book. Thank you for reading it. I'm so honored. And you obviously did because you yes. picked out all kinds of the best you things. You saw the questions. <laughs> so make trouble standing up, speaking out, and finding the courage to lead. And I wondered if you could talk about the very first sentence in your book. Um, little lady, you are just trying to make trouble. Can you talk about the context? <laughs> I know. I was just a, 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 wee, a wee child. Uh, I, was, I grew up in Texas. I don't know if we have any Texans here, but if we do, they know <laughs> how it is. I grew up in Dallas. And um, actually, um, that's, well, that's where this took place. I was going to the University Park School. It was a local public school. And I was in sixth grade. And... My teacher in sixth grade decided to open every day with the Lord's Prayer, which I neither knew the words to or wanted to recite. And so I told her that. I said, I, I actually don't, that's not what we do in my family. And she replied, you know, are you just trying to make trouble? And I realized I really wasn't trying to make trouble, but if she thought I was, then I guess I was, and that was okay. Um, and uh, it sort of... I mean, it's sort of it's sort of stuck. Um, and I think you wrote that you didn't even realize that there was a court decision against this. You no, just I was knew it was say, wrong. Exactly. I just felt like, well, why should she be making me recite a prayer that is has nothing to do with me and certainly had nothing to do with my family? I mean, we were um, we went to the Unitarian Church not because we were religious, but because that was where all the social movements in town were organizing. And so, I mean, I, it was. Uh, but that was, that was Dallas in the day. Um, so I um, was struck by how I didn't realize your mother and your father had been brought up as hardcore Baptists. Well, they weren't actually. Oh. So this is, so my parents were from Waco, Texas, which is even different than Dallas, Texas. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually it's kind of funny. Um, so my, yeah, but my mother got a, a scholarship to Baylor. Um, uh, which is, you know, is a Baptist school, um, a debate scholarship. Her folks had no money. This was a huge thing to get a scholarship. Um, and uh, uh, that was where mother said, so that's where she, she my father, um, they, they met, they got married. His family was absolutely not a Baptist family. And, um, but mom said the great thing about Baylor was everything was more exciting because it was either against the rules or it was a sin. Uh, and so <laughs> you just sort of always, in fact, um, the great singer-songwriter Marsha Ball, from who is also from Texas, said, "You know, you really, um, you you couldn't have sex standing up in Waco, because someone might accuse you of dancing, uh, which was completely <laughs> against the rules." Um, so, yeah, I guess from an early age, I recognize it that there were there were troubles with organized religion. So, before we talk about your mother, Ann Richards. You also had a very strong grandmother, Nona, yes. and there's a couple of funny stories about her. Okay, well, I was hoping I tell. So yeah, so this is this is kind of my background. I so um, my my mom's parents were basically sort of survived the depression. Really, never got over it. Though. I mean, they grew everything. They lived out in the country outside Waco. Uh, I mean, they're they're. You know, they had a deep freeze. You could eat out of it for like two years, basically, because I think they were always terrified of, you know, going hungry. They didn't have any money, so when my when my grandmother got pregnant with my mom, uh, it was unthinkable that she'd go to the hospital because that just well, they didn't have the money, and that you didn't do that. You had your you had your kids at home. Um, so once she though went into labor, uh, she organized for the the neighbor lady to come over and make dinner for my. My grandfather, because of course it was unthinkable that he would cook dinner for himself, even though she was in labor. That also just was not how it happened there. Um, but what happened, the problem was she had planned chicken for dinner, and the neighbor lady didn't know how to kill a chicken. And so my grandmother, Ona, hoists herself up on one elbow in the birthing bed and wrings that chicken's neck. And that's, that's how Ann Richards came into this world, right? So I just sort of think it's a good... Um, but... 
I think for folks, uh, I, I was actually just at an event last night, and someone said, well, how are all these Texas, these Texas women are so tough? And I said, well, that's kind of your only option in Texas. <laughs> if you were going to, you know, if you were really going to do anything, particularly if you were going to make change, yeah, it, it wasn't for the week of And week there of is heart. one other anecdote. When yep. your mother was in the governor's house, she got a phone call from one of your grandmother's neighbors. Yes. So, um, yeah, my grandmother did everything. I mean, she, you know, out in the country, built her own house. But much later, you know, she and my, my grandfather moved to Austin. And uh, my mom was governor. And, yeah, there's a great scene where mom's there in, the, in, the, um, in her office. And her Nancy, her secretary, says, Ann, I'm sorry, you've got to take this call. Your neighbor, you know, Ona's neighbor's calling. She's worried about your mom. And so mom picks up the phone. She says, well, what's going on? She says, Ann, I hate to tell you, but your mother is up on the roof cleaning out the gutters of her house, and she's 86 years old. And mom said, well, there is no way in hell I'm going to get her off that roof. So that's just, that's, that was just how she was. That was, um, and that's kind of how my mom was, too, actually. So, uh before we talk about that, uh, I, I want to, it's not name dropping in your book, but I want to drop some names. When you were growing up, you met an awful lot of very fascinating and influential people, just as a matter of course. I mean, your family camped with Molly Ivan. Yes, Molly Ivans was, uh, who I think some of y'all may remember, is just a... Uh, well, I mean, look, there were about 20 liberals in Texas, and they all knew each other. <laughs> so it wasn't too surprising that everybody... You know, we hung out together. <laughs> yes. And I was also struck that you were campaigning for Sarah Weddington, the young woman who argued Roe versus Wade, then right. went on to run for the state legislature. Right. I mean, that's the incredible thing about Sarah is that, who is still in Austin, just oh. fighting the good fight. Is she and still in the state house? No, no, oh. no. But she's in, but she's, uh, she's as, um, as, you know, unrepentant a feminist as any woman that ever walked this earth. Uh, but yeah, no, Sarah had argued the Roe versus Wade case at the age of 26, still the youngest person ever to win a Supreme Court case. And of course, it was a case that came out of Dallas. And then when she came back, actually what happened is even though, even though she had done that, even though she was obviously a um, uh, renowned attorney, she couldn't even get credit in her own name. She had to have her husband sign for, um, she wanted to open a bank account because she had a law firm. I mean, that was just common in, in those days. And so she got so mad, she decided she'd run for the state legislature and change the law. And that was, um, that was in the day when my mom had never worked for a living. She'd always taken care of kids. And Sarah um, asked her to run her campaign. And mom, it was incredible. Mom so was just... I was going to ask that. Um, when I think of Ann Richards, I sort of assumed she'd had a career her whole life. And of course, no, not in that area. No, no. In fact, she spent 20 years just building up all this, you know, <laughs> energy. And once she found out about the women's movement, it just, she just never stopped. She basically left us back at home and said, I'm going to go do this thing. And, and she ran Sarah's race. Um, and that was when, as kids, I mean, because mom was a campaign manager, that was unheard of. And so we, as kids, got to, you know, hand out bumper stickers and um, file and, you know, uh, learn all those important skills you learn as a young person. Take down the opponent's yard signs. Just things that you've got to, <laughs> you know, in, in really critical. Um, uh, uh, the statute of limitations has passed on all that. But um, <laughs> it was really wild. And, and it was such an, I mean, to me, I really didn't, as a young person, probably didn't appreciate what Sarah had done at the Supreme Court. That wasn't really part of my consciousness. But to have a woman um, win against all odds was really, really quite amazing. So yeah, Sarah won that race and that's kind of what kicked off mom's political career. But so you were really uh, in college by the time your mother was running for governor. She had won, she yes. was the first woman to win a statewide office earlier, she, right? Um, yeah, she had, uh, well first she became county commissioner which was kind of funny because they thought only, only men could be county commissioners because of course you had to do things like look at roads and bridges and heavy machinery. Um, in fact, mom used to uh, say, going to the county commissioner convention, she said, they didn't call it the boots and bellies convention for nothing. It was, um, anyways, uh, so that was really unique to have a, 
have a woman county commissioner, but then she ran for treasurer, and then, yeah, well, we'll talk about what happened after that, but yeah, yes. Yeah, well, let's talk about that then. Okay, Because yes. um, you, you were over in California, you were here in California, right? Yes, Doing labor I, organizing when yes. your mother decided to run. Yeah, my husband and I had just had Lily, our first child, and we were just raising hell in Los Angeles. I was organizing immigrant janitors, Kirk was organizing um, home care workers, folks who take care of people that didn't have a union, didn't have any benefits or, or work, work protection. And mom called and said she was going to run for governor. And so, I mean, it was just like a, a movie. I mean, we just packed up the U-Haul, put all our stuff in, took Lily, put her in the car seat, and we drove to Texas and helped on her campaign. Well, and it was amazing. Of course, she had gotten into the national consciousness at the Democratic Party that famous her convention speech. In, her convention speech in Atlanta. Yes. Do you want to quote that oh. one line? <laughs> I can never really quite do it justice because she had more of an accent than I did. But of course, that was the that was the speech that not only launched her, but that people still report you know repeat to me in airports and on the street like every day was poor George. He was born with a silver foot in his mouth and uh, <laughs> George W. And, um, I mean, this is what the thing, I just think like, I'm really sorry mom died before Twitter because I just think it could, <laughs> she would be giving at least one person I know a run for his money on Twitter, <laughs> yeah. Maybe he could have been elected. Well, so then she ran for re-election. I know you were very involved and of course that was a, a bitter defeat. Yes. But that opened your eyes to a different need. Yeah. You know, people often start groups when they see there's nobody doing something. Right, so. right. Well, so just, and to back up for a second, so I mean, I do think one thing that is important to remember, because I actually was posting about this yesterday, because of course a lot of folks are looking at Texas now wondering, could, could kind of a miracle happen um, with um, Beto yeah. O'Rourke's campaign? And uh, yeah. <laughs> and I... So I think it's important just to put it in context that mom was never supposed to be elected governor. And she, uh, I mean, she had to have a very tough primary to even get to be the nominee. It wasn't like people said, oh my God, a progressive woman, pro-choice governor, that's what we need in Texas. Um, <laughs> and so she had to every step of the way, it was a fight. And, and I actually, there was never a poll showing that we could win that race, never. And yet people just never gave up. And I do think it is an important, for me it's been an important lesson. That was 28 years ago, but it was because teachers and farm workers and LGBT activists and students and labor folks and people who had been shut out of government for so long just never gave up. And it was a grassroots uprising that is the reason that Ann Richards became governor. It wasn't just her, it, was be, it wasn't, I mean, she just represented the hopes and dreams of a lot of people. And I think we are seeing that now in other parts of the country, at least I hope so. So I think it's important to remember, um, you know, polls don't vote, people vote, right? And that's really where we have to remember that's what democracy is about. But yeah, so anyway, she, yeah, she was governor for four years, it seemed like just like a hot second. But it was also important because she was able to appoint more people of color, women, LGBT leaders, um, folks who had never been in office than all the previous governors in the state combined and literally changed the face of government in Texas. And that was, that mattered. I mean, that actually mattered. And, and, and I think that's, I mean, as President Obama did, uh, I think those, those are things we can't really those are things that could never be undone. She did lose re-election to George Bush um, in that horrible, 1994 was a terrible year. Um, she got beat, Mario Cuomo got beat, Newt Gingrich uh, and sort of the Ascendancy. Christian right took over the House of Representatives. And, uh, and in Texas, I mean, they just, it was a wipeout. It was a total wipeout. So you were seeing the Christian coalition begin. Well, and it's funny, yeah, I was kind, I mean, honestly, I didn't know. I think a lot of us didn't know. And in fact, I still remember this sort of apocryphal call that I got from a friend of mine in California. She said, have you heard about this new group called the Christian Coalition? She says, because we're seeing them out here. And I, it, it really wasn't until after the election um, that we realized how much money organizing, 
had been done in Texas, and I remember very specifically going to plant gates in, in handing out literature to union guys who had been our, the backbone of mom's support and who she'd done so much for organized labor, and men snarling at me saying, I'm not gonna vote for that you know, baby killer, lesbian, you know, fill in the blank. And it was so stunning, because it just was, had never happened before. And it wasn't until later we realized there had been a concerted effort around the country, and, and, and certainly in Texas, to not only defeat mom, but you know, elect people to our state board of education. And honestly, they took over the Republican Party in Texas, and, and still they still have, have control. They still yes, have control. They do. And that's where, so it was, um, and that's when, yes, I decided that I was, you know, instead of just being despondent, that we needed to organize, and that's how I organized the Texas Freedom Network. Which is still thriving. Which is today. still, exactly. In fact, it has grown and blossomed and is on the forefront of fighting um, for separation of church and state, fighting for public education, fighting for LGBT rights, reproductive rights. I'm just so incredibly proud of the folks that are in Texas doing that work right now. And we once heard from, we once had Samantha Smoot speak oh. to our conference when we were in San Antonio. Oh, you did? Yes. She's fantastic. So she, is she such came a, on after you. Yes, exactly. Um, we missed I, you. I, got, I, I was able to get um, Samantha to take over, and now Kathy Miller, who was my first deputy, but, yeah, I mean, you may be following, for those of you who are in Texas, this is not news, but, I mean, we're actually now in the middle of another social studies textbook adoption fight in Texas where they're getting rid of, they decided because the book was too big or, I guess, too many details, they would take out Helen Keller and Hillary Clinton, right? <laughs> I know, this is 2018. These are the fights we're having. And, of course, they don't like to talk about slavery. They don't like, you know, they like to celebrate, you know, the Alamo, celebrate the Civil War, uh, mm -hmm. it, and, of course, once you get to the science textbooks, oh, my gosh, it's, it's a nightmare. I remember having to fight over, well, anyway, we could get into it, but you, it's nothing that you probably haven't experienced before, um, although we are constantly fighting um, that, you know, the creation, that putting creationism into all of our science books and uh, the fact that they think evolution should be treated as a theory, um, but that's that's... And those are what our kids are reading in but public schools. The, I mean, we rely on the Texas Freedom Network at FFRF for our own uh, heads up on lobbying in Texas. W what do we need to let good. our members know about? I mean, That's it's, it's no, vital. They do, a, they do a great job. And I might add, I mean, the, one of the reasons it's so important is because textbook, the market is so big That's that if a textbook gets produced in Texas, Unfortunately, it's probably in your home state as well. Because the, Ga the Gablemans, was that it? The original uh, or Gable? The, yes, and uh, uh, yeah, Ga the Gablers. Gablers. And, yes, but they, and look, I mean, the scary thing, it used to be, uh, I remember my first uh, State Board of Education meeting where I thought, well, oh my God, these people are so fringy. This is, in, this is crazy. But the problem is now they're on the State Board of Education. I mean, the same mentality. So it's, it is, um, it's completely run and dominated by um, folks who want to use their own religious, you know, views, uh, and force them on the school children of Texas. A takeover. Exactly. So then you went on to found. I'm not quite. This is not quite in order, but another uh, America Votes. Yeah. And you write, write in your book, coordinating progressive leaders is like keeping puppies in a basket. Just when they are all in, someone jumps out. So how did you do it, and what is your advice on that? Oh, well, no, it's just, I mean, look, it's like, because we're opinionated, and folks, you know, it, we are not, we don't follow along as, as sheep. I mean, I think the reason we started it was because I felt like we had all these different groups doing great work, but none of them were really talking to each other. And um, I think the only way that anything ever works is people don't do things for your reasons. They, uh, they do things for their own reasons. And I think what we were able to show is uh, and I'll, I'll never forget being in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, that it, may, it was smarter in some areas um, for the labor union folks to be carrying the message in doing door-to-door -door outreach on voting, you know, voting. And so the Planned Parenthood folks could actually just go with them and, and help and support them. Whereas in the Philly suburbs, where we had a lot of independent women, labor was able to join up with Planned Parenthood and begin to talk to people about issues that, that mattered to them. And I, I do believe we've gotten better. Um, but I still, it's very frustrating that we haven't made progress on some fundamental issues of democracy. Um, I, I, I feel like as, as even though progressive groups are better coordinated and work better together, and I think actually in the last two years that's happened even more so as everyone has been on the front lines of, of trying to fight back, 
Um, I still think there are so many hurdles to our democracy, to vo basic voting, that even if we are really well organized, um, institutional um, you know, barriers exist, and particularly for uh, working people, for women, for students, frankly, the people who would probably change who was in office if they had the chance to vote. You are being targeted. Now, uh, as a co-founder myself of a nonprofit um, with the Freedom from Religion Foundation, I nodded my head all the time when you were writing about nonprofits and talking about what a privilege it is to work for social justice. And uh, I can't believe they pay you to make trouble. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. Right. Um, and you say that starting your own organization is like being an entrepreneur, only you're not out to make a profit. Um, but I uh, sympathized also about something that came up with Planned Parenthood and abortion. People would come up to you and say, why don't you ch change your name? Or why don't you separate out the abortion from the contraceptive? And I wondered if you could give us your reply. Sure, well, I mean, I spent a lot of time on this topic. And so I guess for those of you who don't know much about Planned Parenthood, we are, um, we've been, we just actually, turned 102, so we've been around a long, long time before, I know, it's like, um, <laughs> and, and I guess I think it's important to put in context too that we were born in controversy. It, you know, people say, my gosh, Planned Parenthood is so controversial. I say, well, if we aren't, then we're not doing our job, right? Because our founder was thrown in jail, as we know, Margaret Sanger back, um, she and her sister had opened up uh, a, a completely illegal birth control center to hand out pamphlets to women. Um, and from the, even though it was illegal, folks lined up from the day one. And uh, it wasn't until 10 days later that an undercover cop posing as a mother busts Margaret, throws her in jail, where she teaches all of her fellow inmates about birth control. And so, <laughs> I, which I think is just, I like to remind people of that, that that is the spirit. And so, um, I guess on this whole topic, Abortion, it's important to me that people, um, that all of us understand that abortion is health care. It's health care for people who are pregnant and they need the right to it and it's not different. Um, so we're at least at Planned Parenthood, we are never going to be like, well, you go in one door if you're, you know, getting an abortion or you're going the other. It's like for us, it is the continuum of reproductive health care and we cannot... So much has been done to stigmatize and shame people who have had abortions. And one of the most important things I think we've been doing over the last decade, led by the reproductive justice movement that was way out in front of this, is for women to actually share their abortion stories. And it is incredibly important to me that we all, that we, everyone who can is public about this because it is not uncommon. I had an abortion. I wrote about it in a women's magazine. And I can't tell you the number of women who come up to me and say, Thank you for sharing your story because I was able to go home and share my story for the first time with my family. Um, so we've got to make sure that we keep abortion safe and legal and available. And I know that there are folks in this audience that <laughs> help do that. Um, but I mean, I do write about one person in particular who wanted us to quit providing abortion, but I don't know if you're going uh, to ask about him. Uh, <laughs> um. It's okay, he's related to the president, oh. Jared Kushner, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well good, I'm glad that's how you feel about him because that's how I felt about it too. Well, I mean, I had gotten a call after the election that, Jared, that Ivanka Trump wanted to meet about um, uh, plan, what, you know, how she could help with Planned Parenthood because obviously the president had said he was gonna defund us. And I thought, okay. I mean, I really didn't want to go, but then I talked my husband into going. I said, Kirk, maybe you go to go with me, because I just, I, I, want, I want like a witness. Um, it was a very, uh, wasn't and, it a uh, very weird meeting in a casino or something? It or? was a, actually, it was a meeting in, at, at uh, one of the golf, golf, club, uh, golf right. clubs. I don't even, I've never even played, I don't even know what a golf, what, yeah, I've never even been to a golf course, but it was a Trump golf club, I guess. Is that what you call them? Yeah. A place where they play golf. Anyway. And um, <laughs> so Jared Kushner and Ivanka were there, and that was basically, Jared Kushner said, look, we, we control everything now. Republicans have with the White House, we have Cong you know, with the House, we have the Senate. And so if you want to keep your funding, you're going to have to make a deal with us because, um, and, and it's not, you know, it's sort of like, and this is an offer that's going to last forever, 
and basically he said, if Planned Parenthood will quit providing abortion, then we will, I will talk to Paul Ryan and maybe we'll get you even more funding. And uh, I said, well, first of all, okay, that is never going to happen. We are not <laughs> going to give up, we're not gonna trade away women's access to abortion for money. That's not gonna happen. Um, and um, he said, well, I would just, he said, I just can imagine, it would just be great to have a, like a, a headline in the New York Times that says, Planned Parenthood quits providing abortions. And I said, well, that's not going to ever be in the New York Times. So we're not going to do that. And we went back and forth. And Ivanka was very upset that I hadn't said anything nice about her father. Oh, um, because once he said something nice about Planned Parenthood, I said, I, I know he did. He said that we did great work because he knew women who'd been helped by Planned Parenthood and he was going to defund us. So uh, I said, I couldn't, I, there was really nothing more I could say. Anyway, we went on about our ways. And I, I just have to say this because I think it's important as as free thinkers, as people who um, believe in justice, um, that was a scary time. So I don't wanna, I mean, I know I can kind of laugh about it now, um, but it was a scary time because I knew there were millions of people that, are, that rely on Planned Parenthood. We're their only healthcare provider. And so walking away from that wasn't, it didn't fill me with joy, um, but I knew that we then had to go out and organize like crazy. And so I do think it's important, particularly in these moments when I think everyone is trying to figure out can we, how are we gonna make it through? And that even though you know we were threatened in that way and Paul Ryan said he was gonna have a bill on the president's desk that was gonna defund Planned Parenthood and get rid of Obamacare you know, by the very beginning, I'm just, you know, it was a long, hard fight, but I'm just here to say, Paul Ryan is in retirement and Planned Parenthood's <laughs> doors are still open all across the United States of America. So. You write that one of the things that drew you to Planned Parenthood was that history of brave, troublemaking women. Margaret Sanger, uh, no gods, no masters was her motto. And she said she thought women should have a go to hell look in their eye, you know, um, and uh, that they risked their reputations and even their lives to change things. But you also say you have a concern that for the first time in your life, you are concerned that you will have had more rights than your daughters, that our daughters are going to lose those rights. And I, of course, as a mother, share that concern, mother of a daughter. It is a, is a scary, scary time right now. It really is. And actually, right now, if my daughters lived, I have two daughters, if they lived in Texas, they would have fewer rights than I had when I lived in Texas. Um, because abortion is harder to access. Um, access to Planned Parenthood is much more difficult. So. It's not even a future state. That's right. You know, because I know a lot of folks say, well, now with Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court, which I just can't even believe that I just had to, those words had to just come out of my mouth um, because it is so distressing. But people say, well, with Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court, does this mean that Roe is at risk? And I would say, well, ab I mean, 100%. Um, and that's why women and other people mobilized so, so strongly over the last few months. Um, but Roe was already, At had risk, already yeah. has been undermined and undermined. Um, in fact, I was, I was actually just talking to someone here who is a escort or, or a, um, a, a volunteer Planned Parenthood in California saying a woman from Alabama had just been brought by her grandmother uh, to get abortion services in Pasadena, California because she couldn't get them in Alabama anymore. I mean, so this isn't like a, this is not a theoretical intellectual issue um, and it's happening already all across the country. Well, when you wrote your book, Neil Gorsuch had just been confirmed, but of course, not Kavanaugh. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Planned Parenthood. I know you've retired from it, but just to go over all that it does. Yep. No, I'd love to. I mean, so we um, actually, the latest poll I saw or sort of research was that one in three women in this country have been to Planned Parenthood at some point in their lifetime, including me. That's where I got birth control, right? It was like, um, so it's, it's not a, it's not a kind of a random, uh, thing. It's actually a community, um, healthcare provider all across the country. We're in all 50 states and we provide safe and legal abortion and proudly do and will. We also provide birth control of all types. We provide STI testing and treatment. We provide for a lot of people and particularly women, um, we may be their only healthcare provider, so They come for their breast exam and their annual, 
Um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that we are also expanding LGBTQ services. And in fact, I, um, one of the last things, yeah, so, I mean, this is a very dear story. I was just, um, one of the last things I did before leaving, we had um, spent a lot of years raising resources to expand services in the South because, of course, healthcare outcomes and access to reproductive health care is particularly bad in the, in the Deep South. Um, so before I left, we, I actually got to cut the ribbon on a brand new health care center in South Carolina that not only is providing uh, safe and legal abortion services, but we're also providing transgender care there in South Carolina. And um, it's um, as it should be. Uh, it's just been really in interesting to talk to patients and to talk to providers about um, the shame and the stigma and just the downright challenge there, uh, there that exists everywhere, almost everywhere, for transgender people to actually get um, life-affirming medical services by someone who knows what they're doing. And that is, it's like extraordinary to me. A, a, young, a young man in Virginia said to me, uh, going to Planned Parenthood in Richmond was the first time I had a, a doctor who actually knew more about my healthcare needs than I did. And that's, um, so we gotta change that. Um, and I'm proud that Planned Parenthood is doing, doing more and um, Planned Parenthood also serves many, many low-income women. Yep. Predominant, I mean, Predominant. Yeah, I'd say like 75% of our patients are at 150% of poverty or below. A lot of them are young people. And I think, I mean, that's the other thing that's crazy, and this gets back to the work even at the Texas Freedom Network and some of the fights we had um, uh, under, under uh, actually the Bush administration, but then it got, got better, is that uh, we provide sex education to tons and tons of young people. And for a lot of young people, they live in places that you don't get sex education in your schools. And in fact, one of the things that just makes my head sort of explode is that um, we actually got this teen pregnancy prevention program under President Obama. And we actually are now, uh, there's a lot of things that are really, that have happened that are good in the healthcare field. But one of the most amazing to me is that we're at a record low for teenage pregnancy in the United States of America. And that really, <laughs> That's a big, that's a big thing. Um, so you think, because you know, folks always say to me, well, where can we find common ground? I say, well, I think that's like, that's about as Should common ground common as you ground. get. And yet this president is now, I mean, we're in, we're in a lawsuit against the administration, but they are now trying to end the teen pregnancy prevention program and give money only to abstinence only organizations that are not healthcare providers. And that are usually that, religiously based. Oh, 100%. 100%. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, and I think this is a, it's just, it's one of the things that really upsets me. I mean, my three kids are now grown, um, but I think of, there's so many young people that if they don't get sex education when they're in high school, that's Where it. else are they going to get it? And then they go off, and they may leave home, they may go to college, and I just feel like it is, I think it's directly related to the issues we have around sexual assault, sexual violence, the fact that we don't even talk to young people at an early age about what healthy relationships are like, and we are doing an enormous disservice to young people in this country, and it just is very, anyway, it's upsetting. It's upsetting. Now, um, to get to something more cheerful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I laughed when I read how your mom used to quote Edna St. Vincent Millay. Do you remember the quote? Oh, do I remember it? I, I, it's like indelibly etched in my brain. Um, as mom used to say, uh, when people would get frustrated with this current state of affairs, um, she kind of, um, with, with light edits, she said that what Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote was that life isn't um, one thing after another. It's the same damn thing over and over again. And I think that is sort of how it feels. With the reproductive rights. That with a little bit of, I mean, with a lot of things. A lot, with of, a things. lot of things. But we've been on the defensive yes. for so long. Um, I'm not sure what age you are, but I remember when Roe versus Wade was handed down. I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, we thought the battle was over. Right. So, um, I'm wondering uh, a few more serious things, and then we hope to have a little time for questions. I'm going to check the time. Okay. Uh, um, we're, it's getting running late, so how about I'll end with, um, let's see. Um, just your thoughts on how we can counteract this weaponizing of the idea that religious rights gives you the right 
to impose your dogma on other people and even deprive them of civil liberties? Yeah. Well, that's a big, big. that's that's a big task. Um, but I, I mean, I do think one is we have to vote, <laughs> and it's just all the other things we're doing. It's so distressing that we don't. We are, I mean, even my home state of Texas, we're not a red state or a blue state, we're a non-voting state. And um, it's just true. And so I think we have to rehabilitate that. And absolutely, we have to stand up for the right of people to believe and think and live in whatever way they want to. And I think that was really the, that was how we, that was how we held ourselves or tried to at Planned Parenthood. That people needed to know there was a place where you could go as we, you know, our, our tagline was care no matter what. That means no matter um, your beliefs, no matter your income, no matter your immigration status, no matter who you, who you love or where you live. And I just think we need more of that in this country. And as I think, I mean, obviously you all know you're at the forefront of this. That is increasingly what young people in this country want too. They don't want to be judged. They don't want to be shamed. They don't want to be labeled. And they don't want anybody using their own religious values um, to uh, tell them what they can and can't do they with their lives. Hate. That's right. No, absolutely. But when, and I mean, and that was, I think, what I mean, that was one of the things that happened in Texas way back when. I remember actually when we started the Texas Freedom Network. Um, that was when suddenly this bumper sticker. I guess it's probably you probably even sell it on your website or something. It was like, God, please protect me from your followers. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was really, people felt like. How did, where, when did this idea come up with that there was certainly, there was like one true way, one true religion, and of course religion was being used um, to, uh, to go after women's rights, to go after LGBTQ rights, obviously it's happening again more and more and more, and I mean, I'm so, it's, I'm so grateful for what you all do, because I do believe, I and mean, what we all do, because um, the hypocrisy of the evangelical community standing with a president who has thrown in their face every single tenet of what they you know, purport to believe, if there were never a time to really unmask the danger um, uh, to people of having religion government. dictate government, this is it. Well, the this religious the right has totally ceded the high ground. That's right. So I do have one final question which is you know, on the eve of this momentous, um, this is the weekend of, of this momentous midterm election, and you've been campaigning so much around the country. You have just recently retired from Planned Parenthood. You have defined politics as a contest of wills between folks who are satisfied about how things are and those who are passionate about what could be better. I do want to ask, what's in your future? Do you have some plans? So I, um, I don't really know, and I didn't, when I, I, I did step aside at Planned Parenthood, but I hate the idea of retiring because I'm definitely not retired. But I did think, I just want to say one thing about that. I think it's really important. I had the best job, I think, in the world for 12 years, um, being the president of Planned Parenthood. It was the honor of a lifetime, and I could have, I could have stayed forever. I loved, I mean, I loved it. I loved everything about it. But I also think as an organizer and as someone who I spent a lot of time and resources to invest in young people and a new generation, it's important for those of us who have had these awesome opportunities to step aside and make room for other folks. And so I think just that's kind of why I, I don't want anyone to think I gave up on the fight um, because I also believe there's never been a better and more important time for us to organize as a country. And so that's what I've been doing is running around the country, not only supporting people who are running for office, but try to figure out how do we take this moment, um, this organizing moment, and make it into a permanent movement for equality in the country. And that to me is, that's the challenge is, um, and it's not going to, I mean, some good things I hope will happen on Tuesday, but that's just the beginning. It's gonna take us a long time to get out of the fix we're in. Um, and I think it requires all of us to think about um, what we do, how we live our lives, how we build multiracial, um, multi-generational um, organizations and coalitions. And uh, the exciting thing is, I do believe that um, change is coming. And I think what we are experiencing now in this country is, I hope, the last grasp of the patriarchy, seeing that their time is almost over. And it's, um, so. Well, thank you. Now, 
are you game for a couple questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. So Cecile is game to take some questions, and we have should have standing mics. Are there standing mics like they're supposed to be? Can you see them? So, um, is there only one or? A All right. Hi, I'm, yes. I'm Jane um, Roberts of uh, oh, 34 you. Million um, Friends of the UN Population Fund. Oh. And uh, Cecile, how are you? I'm here, I'm way back here. Does it oh, I see there are two in a row. There's one in the very back. Oh, we okay, can't sorry, see you. we can't see you. Is that oh, Jane? Okay. Yeah, it's Jane. Hi. Hi, how are you? How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm fine. You do amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, pe yeah, people look up 34millionfriends.org, but the UN Population Fund does around the world uh, what Planned Parenthood does in our country. That's right. Um, tell you one teeny tiny story. Uh, a girl was pawned off in marriage to an older man in Nigeria not too long ago, uh, one of these early marriage, forced marriage type of things, and uh, her husband, who had three other wives, asked her to prepare a celebratory meal, and she did, and she put a rat poison in the meal and killed him and, and uh, his guests. And, you know, this is, this is worse than can happen in the U.S. So we have to think abroad, too. We have to think internationally. So 34millionfriends.org, everybody. Thank you. Yep. I, I totally agree that this is, uh, there are movements of women that are um, springing up all over. And I think it's important that those of us in the United States who can and are committed to building um, a movement here link up. And I, I will say, because what I'm finding in these towns around America when I go and talk to, or really sit and try to listen to women is, what's inspiring to them is seeing other women doing amazing things. And I will tell you, personally, seeing the Irish women go home to vote and uh, finally change abortion laws, and that, that's, um, that, that gave me hope, because we have so much work to do here, so I do think it's important to recognize that and also recognize, I'll just say one thing, Jane, because you opened this international um, box of, there's so many things about this government, obviously, that are not just the damage they are, they are doing here, but they're doing abroad, the global gag rule that is preventing millions of women from getting access to everything, maternity care, you name it. The problem is, as well, once they were successful in doing that, they are now, any day, going to implement a domestic gag order in the United States of America that did not, that basically prevents medical providers, including groups like Planned Parenthood, if they serve pa patients uh, with public funds, prevents them from telling them their legal constitutional rights to reproductive health care. It's outrageous, and it's why we have to be paying attention to not only what our government is doing, what they're doing globally, because it's all coming back here domestically as well. So be aware. So let's alternate uh, the yeah. mic. So. So as a sign of hope, I would like to um, tell everybody that in 2016, the state of California have passed, has passed a comprehensive law for um, the um, birth control and education in the schools, and not only in the high schools, but also in the middle schools. So my 12-year-old son is just now getting the chance to get this education and all of his classmates in a um, Hispanic in a charter school, a German Hispanic charter in San Diego, and he's only 11, 12 years old. So we're finally, we're getting this in the American schools. And I think that's a great sign of hope. And it's inclusive, it includes, um, I was able, as a parent, I was invited to see this program being developed, and as an outsider, I'm not part of it. But it was great that we finally have this here in this country. And I'd like to ask Cecile, what are the chances that the California legislation, which I think is fantastic, can be adopted in other states across the country? Uh, well, and congratulations, and there are great things happening. I was just in Oregon where they have a comprehensive reproductive health um, uh, law. Uh, it's all about who's in, in the legislature. So I, I think your point is exactly right, and that's why voting is critical. And just this year, so if we're going to be hopeful, there are 80 women of color running for Congress this year. That is a record. It has never happened. Um, and in fact, 
I just got this, I just saw, I just read this morning that of the competitive congressional races in the country, more than half of them, women are the candidates. And so I think it's really, that is that matters. It, who's in office is who decides whether we get bills like that. And I just, I hope I live to see the day when half of Congress can get pregnant and then mm. we will quit fighting about birth control and Planned Parenthood and abortion and all the rest of it. That was a great way to end. Um, maybe two more quick questions. Go to the uh, back. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the face of Citizens United, I, I don't understand how uh, voting in this system whereby most powerful elites at the top, the billionaire class, uh, however, the corporate class, controls the election process, controls who gets uh, uh, subject to running even, so financing, the whole nine yards. How do you uh, propose that this is gonna be a solution to change anything? So, um I mean, I just think not voting is not a, not a solution, um, but I will say... How about a boycott? Well, unfortunately, a lot of people, without calling it a boycott, do boycott and they don't vote, and exactly. that's how we got... Uh, that's one of the ways we got the president we have. But I just think it's important, because I, I like to look at, actually, what can happen, and I will say, I've been, you know, I've been working as an organizer my whole life, and I saw African-American women in the state of Alabama elect the first Democratic senator in more than 25 years this year. And that's because they didn't give up and they believed in it. And I could go case by case by case. Folks in Virginia elected the first transgender uh, woman ever to the legislature. In Texas, we're gonna send the first two Hispanic, Latina congresswomen ever to, to Congress. So to me, that, that is, that's change, and that does make a difference. And, but I'm not here to defend Citizens United um, at all, but that's why we actually have to fight back and elect people who I think represent our values. And I think we do have to end. I'm sorry, but we want to stay on schedule. Sorry, you can, we are doing the book signing at that table if it's cleared, that first table. Um, if we can put you yeah, there. Absolutely. Annie Laurie, thank you well, so much. Thank you, thank you so for much. having me. It was wonderful. <laughs>